what in the world is going on? At the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, we're answering questions like these every day. In the classroom. Are they in the sample? And on the front lines. So join us for the manatee and humanity. Hello, welcome everyone. I'm, so, I'm sorry for the delay. I just wanted to let you know too that the Dean sends his regrets tonight. He was not feeling well, so I told him, I said, you need to go home. Don't make us all get whatever you got. <laughs> so I saved you all. <laughs> So I just wanted to say, one, uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you for coming tonight and to this lecture for us to hear uh, Dr. Greg Stone. I am Jennifer Dillon, the Executive Director of Development here at the Rosensteel School. And my role is to, to help uh, you know, the university achieve its mission, uh, yes, for the manatee and humanity and so much more. Um, sea Secrets is our premier community outreach event. And we couldn't do it without the, the you know, sponsorship of our friends that, that support it every single year. I want to say thank you so much to the Bank of America for being, uh, this is our second year of supporting with them. And <laughs> thank you. I also like to thank our other, our other sponsors for Sea Secrets, the Shepherd Broad Foundation, Meredith Ann Dasberg Foundation, Bill Galway, Cheryl Gold, the Key Biscayne Community Foundation, Joan McCann, uh, Foundation, Taylor and Man Melissa White Fund, uh, Nikki and uh, Myron Wang family, thank you so much, the Welch Family Foundation, and Southern Glazers uh, Wine and Spirits for providing the wine this evening. If any of you here would like to become a sponsor of Sea Secrets or you're interested in helping us do some of the research or support students or faculty, you can see me. That's my job. I'm, I'm happy to, to be the intermediary and share what we do here with you and how you can help us move the needle on the research that we do here at Rosensteel School. Um, a few housekeeping items. I'd like to say, if you haven't already, please turn off your phone or your iWatch or anything that you have that might go off magically in the middle of this, this uh, presentation. Um, as it is tradition, I want to uh, share with you a couple of our alumnus, alumnae, who are fantastic work uh, researchers here at the Rosensteel School, and I'm going to do their introduction for you. Um, it's Jill Richardson and Dr. Maria Cartolano, and they are going to be sharing with us for a, a, section, a section, a project that they work on every single year, Ocean Kids. But first, let me just introduce Jill Richardson. She graduated from UC San Diego with a dual degree in biology and anthropology and joined the PhD program at the Rosensteel School in 1997. Following graduation, she became the director of research and education at a zoological facility and was then offered a full-time faculty position at the university in the fall of 2007. She is a pathologist by trade, and her earliest research focused on coral diseases, and she now studies the complex health issues in marine animals as sentinels of ocean health. As director, she helped develop the Master of Professional Science program. Jill was nominated as University of Miami's Outstanding Program Director two years in a row as an outstanding faculty member at the UM Apple Polishing Ceremony, named an honorary member of the Golden Key International Honor Society. She was acknowledged as an advocate for student success and for outstanding, the outstanding job in the capacity as an educator. The recipient of Excellence in Programming Award for the Ocean Kids event and a scientific advisor on a screen and a screen scientist for the Emmy-winning children's show Sci Girls, which promotes young women in science. Aside from teaching and inspiring the next generation of scientists, her greatest joy is being a mom to two incredible little boys. Dr. Maria Cartolano, she is very young. I think she's the newly minted, right? Newly minted PhD, uh, 2018. And I just wanted to say welcome, thank you for, I'm, I'm, I've worked with both of them on Ocean Kids, their little project, uh, trying to, you know, secure some funding for this, this program. Um, Danielle 
uh, McDonald. She's, um, a, she was a junior. Oh, she began studying and working with Dr. Danielle McDonald at the Rosenstiel School as a junior in 2011. And she continued in her lab as a PhD student studying chemical uh, communication and behavior in Gulf, Gulf toadfish. Maria defended her PhD, like I said, in July 2018 and is now a postdoctoral associate studying the effects of deep water horizon spill on the vertebrate stress response. In addition to re uh, research, Maria is very passionate about outreach and believes strongly in the mission of Ocean Kids, of which she became involved with as an undergraduate. It's a really interesting program. Um, they're going to share with you. Uh, I wanted to say thank you guys for coming and doing this for us. Um, I'd like to share, have you guys come up here and go ahead and share, um, you know, your, your program. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. It is an honor to be here as the alum highlight uh, because it gives Maria and I a chance to share with you a few details about an outreach program that is very near and dear to our hearts called Ocean Kids. Uh, people like to ask me how Ocean Kids began, and I love to say that it started with a really terrible year. Uh, 20, 2007 was arguably one of the most challenging years in my personal life. I definitely will not bore you with the details, but I do want to tell you what a great mentor said to me. She said, okay, Jill, I hear you. And uh, here's what I have to say. I want you to know that if you think you have problems, in my humble opinion, you need to go find new ones. <laughs> and dang, if that didn't stick with me. Uh, and Ocean Kids became my inspiration to identify bigger problems than mine in a community that I loved dearly and still do. <laughs> So Ocean Kids has a very strong and direct impact both here at the university and in the greater Miami-Dade community. We bring in elementary school students from at-risk communities to the university and provide them with a day of ocean science, conservation, and fun. And we specifically target schools that have high Title I enrollment and low performance ratings. And the reason we do this is because these public school districts unfortunately don't have the resources for these children and missed educational opportunities can um, unfortunately cause uh, young children and young adults to be trapped in a cycle of poverty. Uh, many students in the greater Miami community are at risk for poor academic outcomes. And studies have shown that although children are naturally inquisitive, their interest in STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, tends to wane by the time they get to middle school. So what that means is if you don't catch them as elementary age children, you've pretty much lost them forever. So in 2008, I hosted the inaugural Ocean Kids event from very humble beginnings. And one of the things I wanted to share with you is that I remember standing in the parking lot of one of these elementary schools in Liberty City. And I was with the head of the school and we were saying goodbye. And I looked over her shoulder at I-95 looming behind her thinking, oh man, my commute is gonna be rough. And then she said, you know what, I really want to tell you that you have no idea how much this is going to mean to them. Most of our students have never even been on I-95, let alone a college campus or to a beach. So in addition to this impact that we have on our community, Ocean Kids tremendously benefits the UM undergraduate and graduate students. And as I can attest, UM students are eager to uh, participate each and every single year. So in addition to um, students enjoying the event, it actually benefits us greatly because it creates a civic responsibility for us and it also improves our ability to communicate research and conservation to members of the public. And if our ultimate goal as scientists is to preserve the health of our oceans, it is critical that we educate and engage member, every single member of the community, especially future generations of scientists. Now, I've been involved in Ocean Kids for seven years now. This March will be my seventh event. So I'm a great example of how UM alumni have been impacted by Ocean Kids, but I'm certainly not the only one. Ocean Kids has had a profound effect on, impact on all of the uh, volunteers. In fact, some uh, UM alumni have actually brought Ocean Kids events and hosted them in places such as South Carolina and Kuwait. Now, Jill, Jill and I could talk all night about how much we love Ocean Kids, but we have a video for you guys to show you just really exactly what Ocean Kids is all about.
when young students from under-resourced communities are provided the opportunity to learn about our oceans in a fun and interactive way, they're more likely to pursue a career in science and have a positive impact in the community. That's why 10 years ago, the University of Miami Rosensteel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science developed Ocean Kids, a day of discovery and fun for elementary age students. Since our first Ocean Kids event in 2008, we have impacted over 2,000 students from high needs education districts in Miami-Dade County, inspiring them to become ocean stewards with a hands-on day of experiential scientific learning. The Ocean Kids event also gives over 100 UM students the opportunity to make lasting connections with children and teachers from underserved Miami communities by sharing their passion for ocean science and conservation. This fosters a constructive citizenship and inspires a future generation of scientists to ensure the broader impacts of their work. The students that attend the event will rotate between what we call stations, education stations, where there's a hands-on activity and each activity is strategically designed to get them excited about the process of discovery and learn something about ocean conservation. The goal is to foster awareness, get them excited about learning science and education, and have them go back into their communities and share that knowledge with their friends and their families and their neighbors. The Ocean Kids events is extremely important and personal to me because I am a former student of Miami-Dade County Public Schools and I attended those Title I schools and I know that it makes a difference. Programs like Ocean Kids help students that didn't have access before. I know I didn't have that growing up and because I've had access to programs like Ocean Kids, it helped raise my awareness about the sciences and it helped me get to go on the science track um, as an adult. We want to continue to make Ocean Kids better and better each year. That's why we need your help. Our goal is to raise funds to offset the cost of this year's Ocean Kids event. Your contribution will go towards all of the supplies and materials needed to host the event, transportation, and meals for all students involved, and also a modest stipend for one graduate student who will assist with planning and coordinating the event. With your help, we'll be able to make this year's Ocean Kids a huge success for the University of Miami and for the local community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. That was so great. I love that video. Um, I just wanted to say I think it's now time. I'm going to introduce Andrew. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Again, I'm going to shamelessly plug this. If anybody wants to talk about Ocean Kids, uh, my name's Jennifer Dillon. You can contact me. <laughs> I'm terrible. That's OK. <laughs> um, Andrew, Andrew is a professor of marine biology and ecology at the Rosensteel School. He is going to be uh, introducing our speaker here tonight. Aren't you an alum, too? Yes. What year is that? 1999. 1999 graduate, too. So. Welcome. Thank you so much for doing this tonight. We appreciate it. <clears throat> thanks, uh, thanks so much, Jennifer. Yes, I, I got my PhD here at the Rosenstiel School back in the last century, 1999. Um, so it's actually, I've spent 19 out of the last 25 years uh, here at the Rosenstiel School, and I came over here as a graduate student from Great Britain uh, back in 1993. So we have a fantastic speaker lined up for you tonight, um, and it's really my great pleasure and honor to introduce him to you. Um, it's Dr. Greg Stone, and as I, I'm sure you all read in your flyers, uh, CNN has described him as the swashbuckling Indiana Jones of the sea. Um, and I, I have to say that I think this is probably unfair to Greg because uh, Indiana Jones never published anything like as many papers as, <laughs> as Greg has. Uh, but he is an ocean scientist and an explorer. Um, he has over 10,000 uh, dives uh, all over the ocean's uh, surface, the oceans throughout the world, uh, as deep as 18,000 feet using submarines, scuba, uh, underwater habitats, robotics, you name it, he's probably done it. And 10,000 dives is a hell of a lot of dives. <laughs> But my introduction is not yet over. <laughs> um, so in addition to being this uh, adventurous explorer, he's also widely known as a global thought leader. 
in the marine sciences and in marine conservation in particular. Uh, he finds ways for humanity and the ocean to sort of coexist and support each other in ways uh, that uh, complement one another and complement the coming science and technology, as well as uh, human cultures around the world that obviously differ in the ways that they interact with the ocean. Um, <clears throat> he co-founded the Ocean Health uh, Index, uh, which I encourage you to look up online, oceanhealthindex.org. Uh, and he specializes in sustainable fishing, aquaculture, climate adaptation, and seamount ecology. Um, and as you'll see in a minute, he's a fantastic communicator who's really well suited to dealing with and communicating his science to public audiences such as this one. He's authored hundreds of publications uh, and four books, one of which was the Outstanding Outdoor Book Award winner. Uh, his most recent book, is, which I recommend, is 2017, Soul of the Sea in the Age of the Algorithm, um, which is a, sort of a manifesto for a prosperous world that incorporates science, technology, and respect for culture. Um, I first sort of came across Greg in the 1990s because he was really a key driver in the establishment of something called the Phoenix Islands Protected Area, which is in the island of Kiribati in the central Pacific, really out of the way area. He was uh, largely responsible for driving the effort that turned that area into what was at the time one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, marine protected area in the world. This was an area of the ocean that is uh, 408,250 square kilometers in area. That's almost three times the entire state of Florida. And the reason why I mention this, this was 2008, is that that really sparked what became uh, a sort of a, 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 a rolling stone. And there's been a huge interest and um, uh, momentum in building these large uh, what's called sort of pelagic marine protected areas that cover large swaths of the world's surface area in an attempt to try to protect as much of the ocean as we can. So we now have huge uh, pelagic marine protected areas in places like the, the Chagos in the Indian Ocean, uh, Rapa Nui, that's Easter Island, the, the Coral Sea, the Ross Sea, the Cook Islands. Upcoming, we've got Ascension Island, Tristan da Cunha. And so these areas are hundreds, if not in some cases, over a million square kilometers. And, and really, Greg's work in, in the Phoenix Islands paved the way for that. His accolades include uh, the Explorers Club. Uh, he received a Pew Fellowship in Marine Conservation uh, back in 1997. That's actually how I know Greg originally for his work reducing marine mammal bycatch in the South Pacific, working, I think, mainly in New Zealand and Fiji. He's a National Geographic hero. He's Boston Sea Rover's Diver of the Year. He has the medal from the Order of Kiribati, uh, as well as the Service Medal from the US National Science Foundation and, and Navy Antarctic Service. He received a Nogi from the National Academy of Underwater Arts and Sciences. And as I said, I first came across him when he was Vice President for Global Marine Programs at the New England Aquarium in Boston, where he was for about 16 years in the 90s and early 2000s. He then took over as Chief Scientist for Conservation International in Washington, DC, where he was head of their Global Ocean Program for almost another 10 years. And then he went on to become Science uh, Senior Advisor to the, special en to the Special Envoy for the Ocean uh, just last year. He's chair of the Oceans Council for the World Economic Forum, and he's currently a chief ocean scientist for Deep Green Resources and president of Ocean Renaissance. Um, so I hope you'll welcome me in joining, uh, in welcoming uh, Dr. Greg Stone. Um, and I just want to also plug the fact that he has a new ocean podcast series coming up in 2019. So if you like what you hear tonight, uh, I encourage you to look out for that and perhaps you'll plug it later on. So I'm going to play a short movie to, to introduce him further, about 90 seconds long. Uh, but in the meantime, if you could uh, welcome me, uh, sorry, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Greg Stone. The ocean is telling us things today. And I think the ocean is telling us that it actually doesn't need us. The ocean is telling us that we need it better stop abusing it. It's going to be here in the future. It may be in a slightly different state or a dramatically different state, but it's not going to go away. Our condition is far more vulnerable. The ocean holds all the cards. My name is Greg Stone, and I'm an oceanographer, marine biologist. I uh, study the ocean, and I work every day to save it. I grew up in, in the outskirts of Boston. I actually didn't live near the ocean, but I was connected to the ocean through TV. 
I watched Jacques Cousteau documentaries as a kid. And I used to sit there on the living room floor with my mask and flippers on, watching these shows. I used to count the days between Jacques Cousteau documentaries. Finally, I got to the ocean when I was about seven or eight years old for the first time and got to dive into the ocean. I remember, I was with my cousin, and he lived near the ocean, and he had two flippers and two masks, so we each had one flipper and a mask. To this day, I remember the colors of the starfish, the, the, the bracing, wonderful feeling of being in salt water, the waving fronds of kelp, and I was totally lost and in love with the ocean from that moment forward. Uh, thank you, uh, University of Miami. Thank you, Andrew. I, I never get tired of hearing great introductions about myself. <laughs> but, but that was probably one of the best. Thank you for uh, the annotations that you added there uh, personally about the, 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 the impact of the Phoenix Islands has had. It, it feels good to hear that, to know that it, that it did have some, uh, some ongoing impact. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you here tonight. And over the next uh, half hour or 40 minutes, however long we have, I'd like to uh, bring you into my world and uh, uh, bring myself into your world, uh, which is the ocean. And I do believe that we are in the uh, ocean renaissance. And you know what they say about a talk, you're supposed to tell people what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them, right? So what I'm going to tell you is that uh, we're in a new age of the oceans, which is the renaissance, the rebirth. And it's the age where uh, we are now everywhere on the planet, and the oceans are everywhere, and all life depends on the oceans, and that's OK. And the issue ahead of us now is um, it's not purely conservation. It's really getting adjusted to the new normal. And that is uh, that we are not a problem. Uh, we have actually uh, come to the natural evolution of our species. And it's time that we just accept that and get about managing the system rather than um, arguing and feeling guilty about what's happened. Let's embrace the fact that we are everywhere. And let's just make sure that we manage the spaceship Earth that Buckminster Fuller so aptly metaphored in the 1960s and get it right. Uh, a colleague of mine last year uh, made the remark that really, really got through to me that he said uh, that the time has come for humans to be present, and he met with sensors or in person, throughout the entire volume of the ocean. And to me, that is really uh, the truth. And it's part of my new book, uh, Soul of the Sea and the Age of the Algorithm. It's about how technology, how this fourth industrial revolution can enable us to do that. Imagine if you had every night not a weather map, but a map of the oceans that had the same kind of detail, so that the guy stands up or the woman stands up and doesn't say, oh, there's a high pressure forming over this area. Instead, they say, hey, the yellowfin tuna are spawning between one degrees north and three degrees south in the central Pacific, so we are going to adjust our activities on the planet to account for that or the upwelling zone off Peru is running at 60% this year, and that's going to have a knock-on effect in this way. If we get to that level of information and detail in the ocean, that's when we will be able to manage this new system that we have created. And uh, I am an ocean person. Uh, the introduction sort of uh, gave you a sense of what got me going, but I'm a tr real believer in communication, and it wasn't just Jacques Cousteau. It was also a very profound movie that came out in 1975 that uh, also impacted me. And that was the movie Jaws. And a lot of people, there's a little bit of controversy around this. Um, but in particular, it was Matt Hooper. It was that scientist that I saw that I wanted to be. And it was the first time, it was the first time that an oceanographer had been portrayed on the big screen. And think about it, they could have had a guy in a white lab coat with thick glasses and a pencil holder, 
But instead, they had a guy in blue jeans with a beard. He was funny. He liked to have a few drinks. He told jokes. And that kind of iconically gave me, and I tell you, a lot of my colleagues about my same age, uh, something to aspire to. So I'm, all, I'm really into popular culture and getting the oceans as in deeply embedded as we can. And Sea Hunt, for those of you, some of the, you in the audience with gray hair, will also remember was uh, another driver for me. I saw this guy on TV every week, and you know, every week somebody would come up and cut his regulator hose, and he was, <laughs> he was trying to do this and do that, and that was also a driver. I actually didn't know that I wanted to be a marine biologist till I got older, and I found out that actually there was a way to uh, make a living and dive all the time, which is really what I enjoyed doing. So I, be, I was a, started out as a pretty traditional oceanographer, but I did always have this idea that you needed to communicate to the public. You needed to make your papers mean something. And that's something Albert Einstein was, was also, it was very important to his work in, in physics was that if you couldn't explain it, if you couldn't get the message through to the public, it probably wasn't worth doing. So in the 90s, I started out on a series of expeditions. I got involved with National Geographic, and I had a formula where I would go out and do something uh, kind of exciting that I enjoyed doing. In this case, we went to Antarctica, and we dove into the biggest iceberg that had ever formed called B-15. And we had to develop kidney warmers to keep uh, our blood warm. And we dove into the ice, and we studied how the melting ice, which was caused from global warming, was impacting things. Uh, this was a picture of me diving into a crevasse taken by the great Wes Skiles, who I know had some connections here at the university who passed away a few years ago in a diving accident, unfortunately. And uh, I would usually write an article for the magazine. There'd be a documentary movie. Uh, and I'd write some science papers. So I sort of had this gig going where I'd try to hit all notes on the subject matter. Uh, if you search National Geographic, you can read my articles and find the books. The last uh, one I did was on sea mounts, uh, which was published a couple of years ago. And there are more mountains in the ocean than there are on land. And they're very important features in our ocean. Most, most uh, currents in the ocean run horizontally so that when they hit a seamount, they turn the water up and it swirls around the seamount. And it kind of creates a, product, a high production area, like tilling your garden, a very interesting uh, uh, phenomenon. That picture is of me and uh, Dr. Larry Maiden, the chief scientist of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution diving into the caldera of a seamount off the coast of Costa Rica, uh, photograph taken by the great uh, Brian Scarry, who I know has spoken here as well, good friend of mine. And then just last year, I was off the coast of Hawaii uh, with the University of Hawaii submarines, diving down into um, some unexplored seamounts. And then we went into Luihi, which is the origin seamount of all, the origin volcano of all the Hawaiian Islands, that famous spot in the Pacific that that, that uh, pushes uh, material up from the mantle, and then the Pacific plate slides over and it pushes through again. The, the, the hot spot doesn't move, but the mantle continues, I mean, the crust continues to move. That's why you have that long, straight line of Hawaiian Islands. They're all from the same hot spot. But we went down into that, into that volcano, that caldera. It's an active underwater volcano. Uh, the, the caldera is about 2,000 feet down currently. And it's not active in the sense of lava pouring out, but it's booming and it's banging and you can see hot water you know, coming out of the seafloor. It's very exciting. And as we were down there, this Pacific sleeper shark uh, came around the side of the, the, the submarine. Now, there wasn't a lot of life there because the water was so acidic and kind of toxic, but the sharks uh, could live there. And then it came right over to the porthole and uh, <laughs> And I, I took this picture actually with my phone. I mean, I, this was not a proof. I just had my phone. I grabbed it and snapped. And she looked right in at me. You can see that she made eye contact. And uh, she swam around the, the sub a couple times. And the, the only other time I saw a Pacific sleeper shark at depth, uh, they did the same thing. And then she laid down next to the submarine for a couple minutes. Then she left. And I'm pretty sure she was trying to figure out what we were. I know she'd never seen a submarine before. And they're not real smart, OK? Sharks are not real smart. So she was probably trying to decide, can I eat this? Or can I have a romantic relationship with this? And, and when she determined that neither one of those was possible, she left. Um, but that was my most, uh, my most recent uh, uh, kind of intimate experience. I'd also like to introduce with you uh, a concept that uh, some of you may already have. But you know, what is the ocean? It's, it's when we go to outer space, we look for water 
if we look for life. And water, you know, you, you're, brought up, you're brought up remembering the idea that water is the universal solvent and that all life is dependent upon it. And, you know, I kind of just, I got numb to that until just the last few years, I really started to think about what does that mean? Well, water is incredible. It, it, it's a molecule that attaches to many other molecules. That's why it's the universal solvent. It has the ability to attach itself to other atoms and, and elements and molecules and transport them to where they can be used so that as you eat something, the nutrition will be grabbed hold of by a water molecule distributed through your body, dropped off. The water molecule will pick up the waste and then will take it out of your body. And in a way, the ocean is, you know, our blood. And it is the lifeblood of our planet. And normally we think of the ocean as the salty part. Well, I'd like to have you think about it in bigger terms than that. Certainly, there is the salty part. That is the ocean. But then about every 33,000 years, the entire volume of the ocean uh, evaporates up into the clouds, and it's distilled, it gets, it gets purified because it doesn't bring any of the minerals or salts with it. And then it ends up as weather, and it comes down through the mountains and through the land, and uh, eventually it gets back to the salty part. So I have started thinking about the ocean as that whole system. So if it's raining, I just gave a talk last week to the Santa Monica High School, it was raining that day, and I told the kids, I said, today the ocean is coming out of the sky. Uh, tomorrow it might not be. And the reason your, your, sud is, your, your blood is salty is because as the ocean makes its passage through the land and through the rivers, it picks up minerals, it picks up the salts, and those salts go into solution, that, that magical property water has to latch onto things. And the oceans were never, they weren't always salty. They were, uh, they were pure fresh water when the earth started. They came in as comets. And the fresh water slowly began to erode the minerals that were on the earth, and it became salty. And then life became dependent upon the salty qualities of that for moving uh, s materials across your cell walls through something called an ionic pump. But if you walk away with anything tonight, I'd like you to enlarge your thinking about the ocean to be the whole hydrological cycle, because we really have to think about it holistically. It's not just the salty part. That's an important part, it's the part, one of the parts that we remember, but it really is this whole magical system on the planet. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, these, uh, these seamounts are uh, extraordinary. I always like to have one kind of luxury slide in my uh, presentations. This was an illustration in the National Geographic article I wrote, but it shows how the currents mix and sweep themselves around seamounts. And on the back end of a seamount, you'll see a spiral there that's called a Taylor current, which is the same kind of a force that you see in the great red spot of Jupiter, to help you remember it. It's a, it's a very special, uh, special quality. I love seamounts. It's really one of the, a really very dynamic place in the ocean. And it's kind of fun getting to them. You get to ride in these submarines. Uh, you shouldn't be claustrophobic. They're very small. They're like three people in a space about this big for any, any number of hours. But it was a ride in a submarine that, you know, brought me here tonight, really. Because in the early 90s, I was living in Japan. I learned to speak Japanese, and I was on a diplomatic assignment for the U.S. government over there with a top-secret clearance to get access to the Japanese submarines. And during a dive to 18,000 feet in the Sea of Japan, I saw, I saw this. I saw... Um, garbage on the seafloor. For some reason, that slide wouldn't, wouldn't show up uh, for very long, but there it is. And it really made me realize early in my career there was something wrong. And in the early 90s, I don't believe the words marine and conservation had been put together yet. We still thought that the oceans were vast and dilution was the solution. But when I saw a place that had never been visited by humans already spoiled, I mean, it would have been like Neil Armstrong walking off of the lunar lander on the moon and kicking a Coke bottle aside before he put his foot down. Uh, I knew there was something fundamentally wrong, so I shifted my career, and that's when I started looking for these solutions, looking for ways for us to live in harmony with the ocean, but also be human, also be this amazing global species that has now occupied the planet. And the ocean is a fantastic 
uh, process. Just to show you here, and this is something that, uh, such a great honor to be here at this university. It's such a storied university, a great, tremendous breakthroughs in uh, atmospheric and oceanic studies. But you can see the Gulf Stream is the major transporter of heat from the south to the North Atlantic Ocean. It also makes Europe a warm place and a nice place to be. Many people say that modern civilization has been dependent upon the Gulf Stream, bringing uh, moderate weather to Europe, bringing agriculture to Europe. If we didn't have the Gulf Stream, England would be like Alaska. Norway would be like Antarctica. And guess what? The Gulf Stream has slowed down some 30% in the last half a century or so. And because the Atlantic is one of the smallest ocean basins that we have, it's like a little cul-de-sac, it's very sensitive to changes. And as we change our climate, we're beginning to change the circulation patterns in the Atlantic. And if the Gulf Stream were to stop or to reverse or change much further, we could see dramatic changes to our own uh, way of being. And that's, that's very possible that, that could happen in a decadal kind of a time frame. But what's in the ocean? It's full of amazing things. I've often thought that if I ever retire, what I want to do is get a microscope and sit around and look at plankton all day. Uh, you pick up any, any bit of water, it's just full of life. It's full of the magic that happens when sunlight hits this planet and starts off with photosynthesis. I mean, that is just such a miracle that the photon goes into the, the molecule of chlorophyll and creates sugar, creates life. You have the DNA of plants in you today because originally all life came from plants. And in the ocean, you can see the constituents of life in its purest, smallest form in the form of plankton. And then there's larger, more dramatic uh, creatures like this pelagic holothorian or pelagic sea cucumber, uh, which drifts around in the water and pulsates. It's quite beautiful. Here's a species that I co-discovered with some colleagues in the Celebes Sea down at about 8,000 feet. When we saw it off in the distance on the computer screen, we were using an ROV. We didn't know what it was. Somebody said, oh, is that a, is that a, is that a squid? Because we saw the tentacles coming out the front. Somebody else said, no, 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 it's a worm. It's clearly an annelid worm. It's got these marks along the side. And we collected it, and it turned out it's a worm. And we called it squid worm. And uh, it, it got the fame of being the, one of the 10 most interesting species discovered during the last uh, 10 years or so. And then there's uh, creatures like this, I like to call it the Darth Vader uh, jellyfish. It's a, not, jellyfish, by the way, is not the right word. You're supposed to say sea jelly, or in this case, comb jelly. But there's just life in all of its forms is represented in the ocean, and it's just such a, an incredible place. And the ocean is not a very big not a very big space at all. Here's a volumetric comparison of all the ocean water on the planet next to the Earth. I mean, look how, look how little it is. It's just, a, it's just like a very sheen of material that's, that's all of this happens and all that's ever happened, all that ever will happen is dependent on that little globe of water. And we're never gonna get any more water and we're never gonna lose this water and we've really got to take care of it. And it provides us with all that we need to live. It's the life support system of our planet. And if Buckminster Fuller you know, was right in his metaphor, spaceship Earth, if you did wake up on a spaceship one day, which essentially is what happened in the last century with modern science, we woke up one day and we realized we were never going to get resupplied. We're traveling at 67,000 miles an hour around the sun right now. What would, what's the first thing you'd do? Well, you'd probably say, what do I got? What supplies do I have? How long will they last? How best can I take care of them? And that's really where we are now. And the challenge is that we have uh, a population that's growing by 80 million odd people a year. And soon uh, we're gonna need uh, twice as much of all the things that are important to us. And every day, there's a day where we use up the resources for that year if we were using the resources in a sustainable way. This year it was August 6, 2018. That means that all the, all the water, all the food, all the energy that you used after that date, you're using into the future. 
by current demand and supply scenarios, which we know are not sustainable. And this is really a comical but sad state of affairs where the ocean is the origin of life. The ocean is where we came from, and this is what we've, we've done to it. Andrew, in his very generous uh, introduction, talked about creating protected areas. And yes, I've had the privilege of being part of that uh, emergence of protected areas. You know, we didn't do much on, in the ocean like we had on land. You see the green graph is what happened on land. And you can see that it kind of hockey sticked up in the 1960s when everybody became aware of the environment. But it's kind of flatlined up until just recently. And because of the work of, of Andrew and others, we're beginning to protect more of the ocean. But we're running into some problems now. And part of the problems are that we're going to the developing world telling them to you know, protect your ocean. And asking us, we're asking nations to shut off vast areas because we've you know, destroyed ours. And these countries often depend on the ocean on a daily basis. Many of them don't have refrigerators. The ocean is their refrigerator. Their lives depend upon it. So we need to start rethinking the kind of language that we use. And we need to rethink of what our objectives are. I like to be, think that our objectives should be optimizing the oceans to support human well-being. We want the oceans to operate. We want them to be healthy. But they need to support people, because that's how things work on this planet. And I, instead of using marine protected areas now, when I'm in t discussions with countries, especially developing countries, you know, if I say, hey, would you like a marine protected area? They kind of go, oh, I don't know. That means I won't be able to go and get fish when I want. I won't be able to feed my family. Uh, but I get it's a good idea still, but I don't know. But if I say, hey, how would you like a fish factory? They go, tell me more about that. Or how would you like a regeneration zone? They go, that sounds pretty good. And those are actually one and the same thing. So we really have to start rethinking how we describe this. We also have to get more aggressive about the places in the ocean that we operate in. Up until now, what's been happening in the ocean is, by and large, countries have been protecting places that we're not using anyway, which is what happened on land. If you look at protection on land, politicians go to those areas with the least political discord and protect them. Most of those big blue patches you see there, not all of them, but most of them are areas where there wasn't anything happening to begin with. And it was easy for politicians to create protected areas, but there was no net benefit. Because in order for there to be a benefit, when you change the designation of an area, it means that our relationship to that area also has to change. What we do to it has to change. And I have to say that the, the country of Kiribati that was created the Phoenix Islands Protected Area, they shut down a, the most fecund, robust tuna breeding grounds in the world when they created the Phoenix Islands Protected Area. And I'm often considered the architect of it. But I didn't create it. It was created by the government of Kiribati. And I give them great, great, I applaud their efforts for actually having the wisdom to shut down an area which they were using very heavily because they saw the wisdom in it. But many of the other areas are desolate, underused areas that look good on a political uh, tally sheet. I was in Svalbard last year. Most people don't know this, but there's an old coal mine in Svalbard, which is the global seed vault. And countries have been depositing seeds in this seed vault for the day when we destroy the planet. And the reason they chose this coal mine is because it's got uh, constant temperature, constant humidity, without any introduction of uh, air conditioning or heat. And the idea, I guess, is that when we really do ourselves in, if we do ourselves in, some of us will put together a canoe or something and we'll paddle our way up to Svalbard, we'll break into this seed bank, and we'll start over again. But it's sometimes called the doomsday vault. So these are very serious matters that we're talking about. And they all come back to the ocean. And why have we not woken up to the ocean paradigm earlier? The first picture that we got from orbiting uh, cameras looked like this. And it was blue. 1960s, 
when John F. Kennedy famously and optimistically said, we will send a man to the moon and bring him back safely by the end of the decade, most people forget he also declared the 1960s the decade of the ocean. That's been lost to history. Instead, we looked up, we didn't look down. But even while we were up there and we sent men to the moon, sorry that we didn't send women yet, but we will one day, as Bill Anders came around on the first orbit of the moon, this picture was taken called Earthrise, and it's blue. Another missed opportunity. We didn't, we didn't get it. And then when Voyager, the first, air, the first spacecraft that, that we humans sent out of our solar system, out into the vastness of space, right when it got to the edge of the gravitational impact of the sun, Carl Sagan talked the engineers at NASA into turning the camera around and taking one last picture of Earth. It's interesting, he had to argue with them. They didn't want to do it for some reason. But they did. They turned it around, and that little dot there is smaller than one pixel on the camera of the day, and it's blue. Still, we didn't focus and realize that we have to focus there. But we have recently, and this is what I call the ocean renaissance. The UN climate agreement has brought the oceans front and center. The UN is beginning to look at the high seas. Many call it the unfinished work of the law of the sea uh, to, to, to talk about how we conserve the high seas. When the sustainable development goals were passed in 2016, we got one for the ocean. And there are other reasons I call this the ocean renaissance, but I really do feel like we have the opportunity now, we must seize it. Because everything that we need in materials, energy, food, and climate have to come from the earth. And most of it comes from the ocean or is dependent upon the ocean in some way or another. And another reason I call it the ocean renaissance is that in a way, we're rediscovering ourselves. Some physical anthropologists in South Africa recently found some caves in Mossel Bay. And they found that these caves had humans living in them 200,000 years ago. They were homo sapiens like us. And at that time, there was a climate shift in the world. It wasn't caused by humans. It was a natural one. But it made the interior parts of Africa very difficult for us humans to live. And it's believed that about 2,000 of us made our way to the coastline somehow and found the ocean. Now imagine that day that it pulled the bushes apart and you see this big, vast blue area. You probably thought it was fresh water at first, but it wasn't, it was salt water. And we took up living in these caves. We started to collect seafood from the shoreline which helped grow our brains with the rich omega-3 fatty acids. It probably gave us more time for culture and learning and it's believed that we spent the next 130, 40,000 years actually as coastal species where we would figure out the lunar cycles because at the king tide, there was an enormous opportunity for us back then because the tide would be about two or three feet lower and the amount of calories that we could collect on a king tide could have changed the fate of a village, could have changed the fate of that village. And king tides are not easy to predict. It challenged us to, to figure things out. And it's very possible that this coastal, it's called the coastal context theory of evolution, human evolution. It could be that this really is the origin of us, this coastal one. The, and I'm not an anthropologist, so I'm, I'm actually parroting what I've learned from anthropologists, that the fossil rich grounds that we usually think about are, are not necessarily where the center of human history, but it's the center of the best place to have fossils be, be uh, preserved. It's very difficult to have fossils be preserved along the coastline because sea levels have been going up and down a lot over time and have washed them away. These caves in South Africa are at the top of, uh, just above the sea level rise maximum. So then we moved out around the planet, but I believe that we took with us this affinity for the ocean. I believe it's part of our nature. It's part of our, it's part of our natural preferences. And if you go to any culture that has remained uninterrupted by the coastline, 
you will find that they have uh, very deeply embedded skills for swimming, for diving. Look at the AMA, the women in the middle. These are the AMA divers from Japan. They're always women. And the, the records go back at least 2,000 years. Every day these women wake up and they go out into the ocean and they spend all day like a seal swimming down deep and, kept, and picking up seafood. The incredible navigation abilities of the Pacific Island uh, canoe cultures. It's not just that we like the ocean. I believe that we are actually naturally suited to the ocean. And it's rediscovering this that the oceans perhaps may save us today like they may have saved us 200,000 years ago when we found our way to the coast of South Africa. And just last month, I was out in the South Pacific, my favorite place on the planet, on a remote island, and I saw this gentleman walking in from the outer reef edge with these, uh, with these shrimp. And I said to myself, this could have happened 200,000 years ago, this idea of a very simple, nutritious, and natural connection with the ocean. And uh, as we leave this historical part of my remarks, I'll just uh, share with you this quote that uh, we are the only creatures on the planet that can run 20 miles, swim a mile, dive down 40 feet, and then go climb a tree. <laughs> now, I just think about that. I won't go any further. But since our time living along the coastline in Africa, we've tried to get back. We've tried all sorts of ways. Alexander the Great had a diving bell made to go down into the Mediterranean. Uh, one of my hobbies, one of my, one of my passions is the history of diving and looking at all the strange ways that we've tried to do this over the centuries. Um, and we've probably uh, killed as many people trying to do this as we have saved them. And then there was a turning point when a young uh, French naval lieutenant was getting ready for World War II. He wanted to fight the Germans. And he joined, he joined a crew. They were going to be aviators and go off and fight the Germans. But he had an automobile accident. And he broke his back. And he had to drop out of the flight training and look after himself. And the doctor said, to take care of your back, I want you to swim a lot. And that French lieutenant was Jacques Cousteau. Everybody else in his flight training team were killed in the very early days of World War II except Jacques Cousteau because he went to the Mediterranean and spent a lot of time swimming because it was good for recovering his back. And that changed everything. Finally, we could get under the water. Finally, it didn't matter who you were. You could go down to Sears or Lechmere or whatever the department. I bought my first set of diving gear at Lechmere. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that, but it's a department store up in Boston. And you could go down, and on the weekends, you could get underwater and be like a fish. And I think that that changed everything. And that was in the 1960s. And my, my book, Soul of the Sea, uh, talks about this history of our relationship with the ocean. And then we also uh, began to figure out the jurisdiction of the ocean. And the law of the sea came about in 1982. And it's like the constitution for the ocean. It's quite a remarkable document, like the US Constitution, that it was very well thought out. And it enables a, it enables a variety of other, of other uh, laws and activities that can happen. Um, the other parts of uh, our relationship to the ocean are the industrializations that have happened. Every time that we've gone uh, explosively crazy with some new fuel or some new, new technology, you know, it's an industrial revolution. And most of these have, have had positive and negative impacts. Um, I won't go into them in the past. If you're interested, you could read my book, as I do detail them in the book. But what's important now is the fourth industrial revolution, which we're just starting now. And that's the revolution of artificial intelligence, of renewa renewable energy systems, robotics and, robotics and big data. And this is the opportunity to take lessons learned, to think about the unintended consequences of the past and make sure that we don't have unintended consequences as we go forward, like plastic. In 1909, the first piece of plastic was made. What a fantastic product. It was inexpensive. 
it appeared to last forever. We could use it for almost anything, and then it got away from us. And now it's predicted there may be more plastic in the ocean than fish in the next 100 years or so if we keep uh, the consumption patterns that we currently have. Um, this is the book pitch part of the talk. There it is. Uh, Co-authored with my good friend and colleague Nishan Dignarian from uh, Mauritius, and he is an economist and was involved in creating the world's first ocean ministry. Very, very interesting guy. And this is uh, courtesy of Doug McCauley, colleague of mine. And what I, what I want to point out about this timeline is to the left is the past and to the right is the future. And what I'm trying to point out here is an optimistic future. I really do think that if we embrace our humanity, we embrace what's happened, and we use the technologies that are emerging, that we can get it right. We can do sustainable food productions from the ocean. We can transform ourselves from the fossil fuel carbon addiction that we have to renewables. Uh, I think that uh, it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of forethought, but we can do it. And learn from the past, where whaling was the first globalized um, ocean industry, where we took a product from the remote, remotest part of the Pacific, and it delivered uh, light to the streets of London and New York and Boston. But of course, in the process, we uh, depleted the whale stocks that had never fully recovered. And then now, today on the other extreme, we've uh, created uh, machines like these submarines that can go under the Arctic ice and surface. I mean, the amount of change that has occurred over the last century is, is just mind-boggling. For me, it's mind-boggling the change that happens on my iPhone over the course of a week. It seems like every, every week something new my iPhone can do that I didn't even ask it to do. It gets reprogrammed uh, at night while I'm asleep. <clears throat> So we are in what I like to call the new normal. And it's where I started the talk, and I kind of wanted to return you to that. Uh, what is the new normal for the Earth? Is it wilderness there and us here? Because that tends to be the debate in most of the conservation community. I don't think it is. I don't think that we, we certainly need wilderness. I've enjoyed my, more than my fair share of it. But it's unrealistic to think that we can just have hands off of our natural environment and let it thrive and be what it was a thousand years ago. No, we need to look at it in a new way. We need to look at it with us as part of that system. And that was one of the things that we, uh, uh, the breakthrough ideas in the Ocean Health Index is that it measured an ocean with us in it. We didn't take humans out of it. A healthy ocean was an ocean that was, uh, an ocean that delivered sustainable benefits to people now and into the future on a sustainable basis. So you need to think, is this the new normal where you have a person out enjoying vast open areas by themselves or with very few people? That's a very bourgeois, uh, very expensive kind of a normal that the world really can't support in very many places. Or like this, you know, one person uh, riding a wave you know, this is more like it. This is, this is the new normal. And we've got to make sure that the, peop that the people in this picture are using products that are not going to pollute the ocean. Like, uh, there are suntan lotions that actually have uh, micro constituents that will go in and de degrade the ocean. Uh, there's plastic in your clothes. Uh, the coastline that you see there could be pumping reactive nitrogen into the water and causing blooms. There's a lot of ways that we can improve this relationship. It's possible that this picture here, if every boat was operated in a sustainable way and every building in the background was also operated in a sustainable way, better yet, in a regenerative way, what if every building in the background was carbon negative? That is, it took more carbon out of the atmosphere than it put into the atmosphere. What if every boat made the ocean better because of the way it went through the ocean? Maybe it collects microplastics in its filters. Maybe it does things to repair the earth. Then this picture could be the new normal. And it's OK, as long as we're regenerating the system. Because we have dug a pretty deep hole on this planet, the way we've used our resources. And that's the whole idea of you know, what is ocean health? And 
Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, it's putting the humans into the system so that it's one human ocean coupled system. You can't take us out of it anymore. And you living here in Florida would know that better than most people. So a healthy ocean is one that delivers sustainable benefits now and in the future. Prior to the Ocean Health Index, uh, how did we measure ocean health? Well, we had thousands, hundreds of ways of measuring the ocean. And the reason that I got involved in creating the Ocean Health Index was that I was challenged by a business friend of mine, Bill Wrigley, the Wrigley Gum Company, who came to me and said, Greg, I love the ocean and I would like to do something to, to save it, but I don't know what to do. I get everybody coming into my office asking for support to save tuna, to save sharks, to save corals. He says, where can I get one scientific measure of ocean health? And it was with this business thinking uh, that we developed the Ocean Health Index. And it was the first time that all scientific data were put together in a very transparent way. And we built the Ocean Health Index around 10 scores. And the scores are all related to people. So uh, food provision, artisanal fishing, I won't read them all to you because they're here. And you can find them quite easily online. But each one of these goals was a goal that we set for the ocean. And then we populated the goal and calculated a number uh, based, on, um, based on good old, uh, good old math. And Ben Halpern uh, from the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, did the, a lot of the heavy lifting with the big data. We had some 60, 70 scientists working with us on this. Interestingly, there was a moment in the development of the Ocean Health Index where we had to define the healthy ocean. And 90% of the scientists said, yes, you have to have people in the system. We're like the fish now. We're like the seals. We're like the whales. We're there, and we have to take account for them. About 10% of the scientists wouldn't have any part of it. And they kind of folded their arms, took their toys, and left, and went back to their ivory towers and only wanted an ocean of some thousands of years ago. They would settle for nothing less. So this is really a point of tension. It's a very important point of development in our society is how we go forward. How do we allow ourselves to occupy this planet, and how do we do it in uh, the best way possible? And I'd like to end this with, uh, I'm now working on getting medals for the fourth industrial revolution. And it turns out that we're gonna need 20 to 30 to 40, maybe even more times as much metal in order to have batteries and electric cars. There's 1.5 billion cars on the planet today. And the goal is to get about 500,000 of those no, 500 million of those uh, electrified by 2030. It takes 15 tons of manganese to make one wind turbine. One Tesla uh, has 1,200 pound battery in it, most of which is nickel. We just don't have enough on land. And the ones that we, I mean, we do have enough on land, but this is the consequence of taking metal from land. You have gigantic open pits, you have tailings, and you have a lot of waste. In order to get five pounds of metal, you've got to take down 95% of a mountain to get the five pounds of metal. There's a place in the Central Pacific that has these rocks that sit on the bottom. You don't even have to dig them up. They just sit on the seafloor, and you pick them up, and they're like three sources of metal in one, three mines in one. And the area is about 1% of the ocean seafloor, it's in an area called the clarion clipperton Fracture Zone. And to the eye, it's a fairly depopulated area of life. There's not coral reefs there. There's not a lot of uh, uh, life there. But there, is, there are these metals there. And it will stop us from having to go to land and tearing more mountains up. Most of the remaining nickel deposits on land are in tropical rainforests. Now, this is also a very contentious issue in marine conservation today because conservationists don't trust mining companies. They think mining companies are bad, but everybody has a cell phone, everybody has a computer, everybody wants an electric car, and there is a consequence to getting those metals. So I just wanna point out that there are, there are ways of getting metals from the ocean that are not as destructive 
perhaps, as ways on land. And it's a big topic of debate right now. There's a lot of science going into it. And it's something we really have to look carefully at. I'd also like to point out, this is a megalodon shark tooth that was picked up on the seafloor. It's a fossil from four, four kilometers down. And it was fossilized with nickel, cobalt, and manganese, kind of an interesting find. And um, that's really kind of where I wanted to, to leave you all tonight, is give you my grand sort of vision of the ocean, where I came from, what's going on, and to challenge you with some of the big challenges before us, and then also get you to look critically at some of the solution paths that may be before us. And I thank the University of Miami for all the great students that you produce and all the, all the good that you do for the world. So thank you, everyone, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Raise your hand if you want to ask a question, and we'll come to you with the mic. Uh, my question is, what, what is being done to uh, take advantage of those fracture zones, as opposed to tearing down a mountain? for five pounds of nickel or manganese? <clears throat> well, there's a, there are a handful of companies and a handful of countries that are now working on that under the aegis of the UN as an oversight body to do the environmental impact statements and to develop the technologies and assess you know, how to go about doing this. So it's, it's, it's happening right now. You'll, Google it, it's a very hotly debated uh, area of work. So uh, people are afraid because they've been tricked in the past by, by, by big industry, by mining. It sounds like a very scary prospect. But if you begin to look at the trade-offs between tearing apart mountains on land, and by the way, if you look at this nodule, they're called polymetallic nodules, there's close to zero waste in this. Everything in it can be used and you have three sources of metal in one. You don't have to have a nickel mine here, a copper mine here, and a manganese mine there. They're all in one place. It's not really even mining. It's picking these things up from the seafloor. You know, will there be some environmental damage to the bottom of the ocean? Yes. But, we, but the question is, compare it to what happens on land. And you've got 60% of the cobalt in the world is handled by children in the Congo. And, um, you know, we have to get circumspect. Yeah, you know, concerning the human factor, is there an algorithm that says how many people we can keep producing to keep the <coughs> planet sustainable and uh, also, uh, you know, protect all the environmental things that seems to be impacting? There, there are there are algorithms that look at that. Yes, and, and they're based on things like how many tons of protein per hectare and and how you deal with waste, but it's, it's, not, it's not about the numbers of people. It's about how we consume and how we deal with our waste is the real question. So, the, I, I mean, I've read some estimates that some people think if we did it the right way, really carefully, the planet could handle 20 billion people. Um, but we can't even handle the 7 billion we have now because we're doing it so poorly. Uh, I thank you for this amazing comprehensive look at the oceans. And when you spoke about the seamounts, I was very intrigued with that. I know just a very little about the conveyor belt they talk about in deep ocean. Yeah. And I wondered if you could comment. And, and also, I believe in exploring space, but I wonder your thoughts about how vital it is to explore the oceans more. Did, did somebody plant that question? <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, Uncle, thank you, Uncle Henry. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, listen, the, uh, we, we need to explore the ocean. We, we have better maps of the surface of Venus than we do of the seafloor. Um, I don't know why we never looked down when we were so energetic about looking up. I really don't know. But we, we clearly have to do more of that, and we haven't. And yes, seamounts are extraordinary features in the ocean, and 
most of them haven't even been explored yet. And they're the size of the most impressive mountains you can imagine on land. And I've dived on a number of them myself, and they're just the most magical places. Um, I can't remember if you had another question, but yes, we need, we need a lot more ocean exploration. Oh, the conveyor belt, yeah. That is really, a, it's called a thermal haline circulation belt. And <clears throat> back in the Miocene, about 25 million years ago, the oceans were warm right down to the bottom, interestingly. And when Antarctica pulled away from South America, it got cold. And the Antarctic circumpolar current started to spin around Antarctica, and it started to chill the water, make the water really cold. And that water sank because cold water you know, sinks under warm water. And that began this global conveyor belt. You saw a little bit of it in that slide I showed at the beginning, which is this just remarkable system of conveyor belts that moves around the planet. And it's all based on differences in density, temperature, and salinity. We have another question here. Yeah. Thinking about um, what I think is very progressive thinking on your part of embracing the reality of we're all here. Yeah. What do you think are the um, real traction points to get people to not separate the two but include the two like, like you're talking about? I think um, it's a privilege in our society to be able to think about the two. Because we can, we can afford to. Um, a lot of places where I work, people can't afford, they can't afford that, that privilege. It's about survival, it's about, it's about healthcare. Uh, in, in countries, some countries where I work, a conservation decision can have an impact where your relative isn't going to get health care for some form of cancer because the country has so few resources, every penny they need has to go to health care. And we in our society are fortunate enough that we can afford to have these value judgments where we can value nature where other societies don't have that ability. So it's a connection, it's, it's a need that, uh, that I've seen firsthand so many times that makes me see it, I think. We have another question over here. You mentioned the word uh, regenerative, regenerative relative to buildings and boats. Curious to get your take on regenerative farming and soil health specifically in terms of building up organic matter and organic farming uh, and its, its ability to then sequester carbon, improve water runoff as a water filter. Don't see a lot of connection to that. There's some farming institutes, Rhode Island Institute in Pennsylvania is starting to make these connections, but you don't really hear a lot about that um, as it relates to you know, bigger agricultural industrial farming. And obviously the red tide recently in Florida has been an issue, and there's some obviously political debate around that. But who's curious to get your take on organic farming and soil health as it relates to ocean health? Yeah, one of the things about my career is I've been very, I've been kind of myopic about the ocean. I don't know much about what happens on land. <laughs> uh, but I can tell you that the, that the, the word sustainable is getting kind of old. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's, a, it's, a, it's an assumption things have to be sustainable. It's no longer a goal. It's no longer a distant aspiration. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a necessity. Instead, now, we have to get clever about whatever we do makes things better. And if there's something in farming that can make things better, it should be done. Uh, we're certainly looking at that in the ocean. We're trying to make sure that um, what I, I know the, uh, the owner of a big European shipping company called Stena, S-T-E-N-A. They're a big shipping company. And that company has a vision that the oceans will be better because their ships move through the water. I kind of paraphrased, paraphrased it earlier. And I said, well, how, do you, how are you going to do that? And they're, so they, then they say to me, help us figure it out, Greg. How can we do it? You know, can we filter the water and take microplastics out? Can we turn our boats into battery-powered boats? Can we uh, use paints that will 
encourage plankton growth instead of uh, uh, killing plankton growth. It's a whole area of research that we need to do that we can do. We have another question here. I saw that one of your 10 uh, factors was carbon capture. Yeah. And I'm assuming that means uh, absorption of carbon from the atmosphere into the ocean. Is that right? That's right. Yep. Uh, uh, so um, I've seen a lot of models that show how temperature will change as carbon uh, increases, um, concentrations increase. I've never really seen anything that uh, connects that to the degree to which the ocean will become increasingly toxic. Uh, and then what would be the consequence? Because if we're in a world where carbon is increasing in the, in the atmosphere, uh, it seems like you're not going to ever catch up if it becomes a toxic environment for marine life. Uh, I'm not sure I tracked that whole question, but I can comment on, on what you said. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how articulate it is, but I, I've never seen how the ocean becoming more and more carbonated. Oh, oh, I see. What that meant was that fixing carbon from the atmosphere was a good thing. And, and it's mostly related to coastal uh, systems because that's what we understand. And it's, it's talking about uh, mangroves and seagrass beds. So if you have mangrove, healthy mangrove and seagrass beds, you're fixing more carbon out of the atmosphere and therefore you'll get a higher score. Yeah, you, if, as, as CO2 gets absorbed into the ocean, it forms carbonic acid, and that's bad. So you don't want CO2 being absorbed in the ocean because it's, it changes the pH. We, we don't know. Uh, that's, that keeps me awake at night. Uh, I'm hoping that there'll be more resilience in the ocean animals than we can, than we can see right now. So we have time for three more questions. I'm going to take this gentleman here, and then I'm going to bounce over here, and then there's a, a lady here in this audience, in this row. You know, now that we know the effects that, that plastic has had on our oceans and fertilizers, the nitrates that run off from our sanctuaries, it's the streams, rivers that run into bays that go into oceans. Now that we know the effects of that, what are we doing? I mean, it just keeps <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that question. You know, there's, there's, the plastic pollution problem has finally broken through in the last couple of years. I mean, it's, I, it's, I just watch and I, and I watch and I wait and I work and I, that one finally broke through. It's now, the Canada, it's one of the Canadian country's number one priorities is plastic pollution suddenly. Well, what you just pointed out, nitrogen and phosphorus pollution, I think are far worse for the oceans and the dead zones that they create. But that hasn't popped yet. Wow. Now, when will it pop? What will it take? You know, you can see plastic, and that's one reason it's popped. There's been more thinking about it, but there, the, every day the Mississippi River insults the Gulf of Mexico in such a significant way that it's on par with what happened with the, with the BP oil spill. But it's, it's this invisible insult, and every major river mouth over fertilizes the ocean and creates these anoxic zones. Yeah, no, it's, I'm, I'm with you, yeah. And, and just one more, if I may, uh, I'm, I'm a part of an organization called Save the Great South Bay. I'm part of the Beach Mall. Oh, good for you, thank you. I don't know. I don't know, but that's the kind of thing that we have to think about. Yeah. That that could be that could be a regenerative activity. I don't know, but but if if you can find natural ways to clean the water that also feeds people, you know, you, you got to think about it. That's that's that whole area. If there are any students here, that's what your PhD should be on: is regenerative behavior and policies for the for the world. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm intrigued with the concept of putting filters 
on ocean going ships. And yeah. I'm wondering if anybody's actually doing research and how far along we might be in developing something that might work like that. I'm not aware of there being any research. And I, I think the impact would be quite small given the volume of the ocean, even though there's, on any given day, there's 75,000 to 100,000 ships on the water. Uh, but I don't know. Someone else might know the answer to that. It, it's more the directionality of the thinking than the actual thinking th that, that I'm encouraging here. We have time for one last question. Anybody on that side? I like um, the idea of the new normal because you're looking at an ecosystem where people are in there and, and there's respect. Um, I'm wondering though, with the way our society is and social equities and, and people who, who don't want to give up that me alone swimming in the ocean and share <laughs> space with others, how has the new normal been received with some of the, the places where you work and trying to make this thought process bring it into actual policy? Well. It's, it's very young. It's not um, that well known yet. But there's another whole talk that I like to give on indigenous cultures and indigenous knowledge. There's actually quite a bit of indigenous knowledge and social practice that has evolved over many thousands of years that works at the village scale and I think could be scalable uh, globally. And I'll give you one example. Uh, the Iroquois Nation Constitution has something called the seven generation rule where the elders of the village are not allowed to make a decision unless it benefits at least seven generations down the line. So if someone comes in and offers them gazillions of dollars to cut down all the trees, they won't do it because it's only going to benefit them. And if we began to adopt more uh, practices like that, I'm just giving you one example, I could name a half a dozen, then it will naturally fall out the new normal and how you, how you approach it. There'd have to be some sacrifices. And, uh, but I believe, it's, I believe it's doable. I used to think indigenous knowledge was quaint and important and belonged in a museum, but I've since learned that it's actually been derived over many thousands of years through, through social evolution and has a very functional role. Uh, Aboriginal culture has incredible rules and social customs that make it so that their society works perfectly and they can be, they can be scaled to... Imagine if the UN had a rule that any resolution at the UN had to be good for seven generations of people. <laughs> and why not? <laughs> All right. Thank you.